very historic events, and of course they surround the castle behind us here. When the, the castle was a Jacobite person located in the castle, and the town was Jacobite, under Jacobite control, which is why the siege occurred in the first place. Once uh, Schomburg landed, he landed in County Down, landed his troops at Groomsport, and this was the main Jacobite garrison, so he needed to capture this in order to keep the, the lock safe to bring in the army. Uh, the Williamites came to an area called Windmill, which is just uh, across from us here, and they would have had their cannons, large guns at Windmill, what's called Windmill Hill, for those of you who are from Carrick Fergus will know where that is, and also near the North Gate, and then as time went on, round the other side of the walls towards Joymount. So that, they were uh, outside the walls, inside was a Jacobite garrison and a Williamite town. So our drama is going to surround all of those things. Um, I'm going to ask Steve now to take things a little further. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve Lally, and I am a storyteller. I'm going to, with the assistance of these people, tell you a story. But what do we always say at the beginning of a story? Once. Oh, very good. But we need your help. So will you help us? Can everybody point to themselves? And in a big, loud voice, repeat after me. It wasn't in my time. Oh, very good. Now, please point at the person next to you, but don't poke them in the eye. And say, it wasn't in your time. Lovely. Now, hold out your hands in front of you lovingly. And can we all say, it wasn't in your mommy's time. Oh, very good. Now put your hands on your hips. Proud, but not arrogant. And can we all say, it wasn't in your great, great, great grandfather's time. Lovely. Now put your hands up into the air as high as you can. And can we all say, but it was a very important time. And all the houses were thatched with pancakes, and the walls were made of penny loaves, and those walls were whitewashed with buttermilk. And outside, the little pigs ran around with a knife and a fork stuck in their backsides, going, eat me, eat me, eat me. Now, the town of Carrick Fergus is a town well remembered in song, poetry, stories, and in the annals of history. It has been the subject of much bloodshed, brutality, and battle. Yet it has survived through these centuries of conflict and upheaval. But never was there so much turmoil as took place in August of 1689, when Carrick Fergus Castle, which stood firm, a stronghold since the Norman era, fell under siege from the forces of King William III. It all began when the force of Williamite troops were led by veteran Huguenot commander Frederick Herman von Schomburg. The bad guys are arriving. <laughs> they landed on these shores and laid siege to the Jacobite garrison of Carrick Fergus. The castle and the town were an Irish army garrison which was used as a refuge for Catholic inhabitants of the region who fled there for safety as the Northern Rebellion against the reign of the Roman Catholic King James II grew and became more threatening. And we are here today exactly 335 years later to witness some of the events that took place during this great siege of Carrick Fergus. And you will hear and see the sound of cannon and musket and the smell of gunpowder as it fills the air as the siege of Carrick Fergus unfolds. This was to be a series of events that would go on to shape the course of history in both Ireland and the United Kingdom and continues to do so. Thank you very much.
the province of Ulster, there is the county of Antrim. In the county of Antrim, there lies the town of Carrickfergus. And in the town of Carrickfergus, on the shores of Belfast Loch, atop the rock of Fergus stands Carrickfergus Castle. Built by Sir John de Courcy in the year of our Lord, 1177, a bold fortress reaching to heaven. Yet the story I have to tell is one of blood, fire and hell, a brutal time in August of 1689. History is full of such fierce things, one of them being the war of the two kings. King William of Orange wanted King James gone. His papist rule had lingered far too long. They say that one can choose friends, but not family. In the case, this was so true, for James was William's father-in-law, and William was his nephew. King William sent the Duke of Shum to fight the Jacobites. Some say Schomburg was past his best, but he was an old war horse. And this would put him to the test and Schomburg was no stranger to war, his tactics, tactics were sure and good. This was to be another victory for the Duke with battle in his blood. Come on now. Irish garrison of 500 fighting men thought they were well armed and set 
but they were no match for this impending tangible threat. Schomburg arrived more with more than 10,000 men. It was inevitable that Carrick Fergus would fall. The only question was when. The Duke needed to see to be a quick and sure defeat, so he may be hot on the heels of James and his men who be running in cowardly retreat. Come on, you cowards, for goodness sake. Sir, I am most honoured, and indeed count it a privilege, to stand before a general known across all Europe. Your Grace, may I introduce myself? I am Sir Charles McCarthy Moore, Governor of this town, and your humble servant. Sir Charles, God grant that we may treat this day with all the teachers of gentlemen, for I am come to do the bidding of my king and yours, his Majesty King William and his most devoted wife, Queen Mary. I require you, St. Charles, that you yield up to the castle, the town, and the castle forthwith. Your Grace, I am indeed moved by your kind words on how affairs between us may be resolved. But I must put before you these particulars. Firstly, I am commissioned by His Majesty King James, the anointed king in this country, to hold the town, Ooh. to hold the town of Carrick Fergus in his name. Secondly, <laughs> my garrison is loyal to me and to King James. and have made good and stout their preparations for the defense of this ancient citadel. And lastly, I hold a town with a great castle keep with stout walls, therefore I am unable to, to oblige your grace in this matter. Sir, I have no wish to press my many advantages, but I charge you, McCarthy, to consider the military facts. I have at my command some 4,000 men and many siege cannon, and mortars set about the town. Come, sir, let us agree terms for the surrender of the town, or blood will be spilt. Your Grace, I am a soldier like yourself, and my eyes have seen war enough. Grant this, I pray, that I may send to His Majesty King James for instruction on how I should dispose of the town, whether to stand or surrender. Purely a delaying tactic, Carthy. I will in no way countenance such a delay in these matters. Sir Charles, the town is closed on all sides by my army, with more regiments attending every day. The siege cannon are set, 
days are out the walls and on Windmill Hill. Enough now of words. My next word message to you, sir, will be heard most clearly, for such is the cannon roar. Prepare to commence our siege, master of the ordnance, bring up my cannon. Group I led by Colonel Owen McCarthy, the governor of Carrick Fergus, Colonel Charles McCarthy Moore, had orders to hold out despite the inevitable score. McCarthy Moore asked for parley, a well known time wasting plan, but Schomburg was wise to this and had no time for poor parley. are this infuriating man. When the talks came to nothing, they fired a cannon on Schomburg's personal tent. And I'll tell you what happened after that, no way.
by the way, you might try to get closer to the, the castle to undermine and, and storm the garrison. Quite a lot of people have uh, left the area in the, prior to this, uh, but one man who's in Carrie Fergus very currently is Richard Dobbs, he's the mayor, and he was imprisoned. He held the giant sword until the aftermath of the siege when it was presented to Schomburg. But uh, there were many refugees went across from East Ulster to Scotland at this time. Uh, William Hayes would have sent women and children across to Scotland. So Richard Dobbs' his wife Mary, Mary Stewart of Ballantoy, was sent across and she gave birth to their son uh, in Scotland and Ayrshire in Girvan. Um, his name was Arthur Dobbs. He came back after all oh, this period. But he's also quite famous together as the Royal Governor of North Carolina. And he was the first man to write about the Venus flytrap. That's one of his claims to fame. So while all this is going on, Richard Dobbs is in the jail in Carrick Fergus, uh, imprisoned as the mayor. And all is not going well for the Jacobites at this point, so the garrison would have been uh, a bit demoralised by what was happening generally. The arrival of Schomburg's troops is a signal that William's army is coming to Ireland. The siege of Londonderry has not been, uh, has been a successful for the Williamites, so it hasn't been a success for the Jacobites, and they've lost the Jacobite leader in Scotland, James Graham of Claverhouse, uh, at the Battle of Killycrankey. So this is the main Jacobite garrison, apart from Charlemont in the west, that is still in existence in Ulster at this time.
Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Mayor Beth Adger is about to light the cannon. So everyone, I want you to get ready, okay? And we all, everyone, I want you all to go. Come on, come on, get the tension going. Ooh, that's it, that's it, come on.
As you can see, it's an exchange of insults <laughs> between the occupants of Carrick Fergus and the Jacobites. So they're shouting insults at each other. It, it seems that trying to provoke them to either come out or get the others to go away, one or the other. I don't know if it's working. Can you guys think of any insults you want to shout? <laughs> oh. He's... We got a man down. Oh dear, we got a wounded soldier. Being taken away to safety. Oh, he saw his hat. Hold on. Hey, just leave him on. Just leave him on.
Schomburg had no time to fuss. He wanted them all out of Carrick Fergus. So this is a last ditch effort by the Jacobites to take on the Williamites and push them back away from the walls of the town and the proximity to the castle. And you might have noticed some troops have left this area, the Williamites. So that has given the Jacobites the chance now to come forward and then, by weight of numbers push them back. Still a few choice remarks being exchanged between them as you can hear. And the Jacobites have, have retreated a wee bit there. Not sure how you feel about that. So the Jacobites now have to decide can they withstand the Williamite siege off the ground here and also in the lock where there are Williamite ships they are firing at the castle and the town. So they'll have to come to the decision shortly as to what the outcome of this siege is going to be. The Williamites continued to bombard Curry Fergus Castle with their cannon fire and musket fire from the land and the sea. And they 
this great and somber is bloody intent and the attack military splendor until the garrison itself was another matter, the walls were being breached and at one point cows were herded towards one of the breaches and when they were shot then the carcasses of the animals helped to build up the area that had been blown away. But the Jacobite plan was to fully retreat to the castle because there plenty of beef and all sorts of provisions to keep them going there. 
And Schoenberg, of course, needed to get this battle over. He needed to get this seat finished with because it was getting on to a time of year when there would be more rain, we were inclement. It wasn't good seeds where they're coming down the line. So the pressure was on him to take the capsule. And the Jacobites must have been deliberating on how long this siege would last, what hopes they had of any success at all, because the Jacobite army was very depleted. And the Williamites were caught before uh, in the north. So that would have made a very interesting situation from both sides in terms of their outlooks to this siege. Schomburg was eager, he had no time to fuss, he wanted them rid of Carrie Fergus. Come right now. Thank you. Yes, Schomburg had no time to fuss, and he wanted them rid out of Carrick Fergus, so he allowed them to march out. 
their arms and their baggage, beating drums and fluttering flags. The war horse had granted them passage to Newry for these broken and defeated. Have your eyes been cleared by the gun smoke of my cannon yet? I saw your white flag pull out to summon this party. Can you see the termination of your lease on this place? For I will have I have but hours away from But in regard the garrison is in such disorders none to be admitted into the town, but such a guard as we think fit to set to one of the gates which shall immediately be delivered to not us so far. according to the customs of war. So far, Three, that the garrison shall march out and be conducted by a squadron of horse to the nearest garrison of the enemy, and there shall be no crowding or confusion when they march out. Four, that nothing be carried out of the time which belongs to the Protestants or other inhabitants. Five, that the governor obliges himself to deliver all cannon and other such arms, munition, victuals of any kind into the hands of such a commissary as shall be ordered by us to receive them. Six, that if there be anything due from the garrison to the inhabitants of the Protestant religion, it shall be paid and what has been taken from them shall be restored. Seven, that a safe conduct for all the inhabitants of the country and such of all the Roman Catholic clergy that came for shelter to this garrison shall be allowed that they go to their respective habitations together with their goods and there be detected pursuant to King William's declaration the 22nd of February last past. Eight, that care shall be given of the sick and wounded men of the garrison that cannot go along with their regiments and that when they are in a condition to follow the rest, they shall have our pass. Sir Charles, are the conditions. Do you accept? Sir, I accept these most gracious terms and thank thee for them. Your Grace, the town is yours. Well? <laughs> Two gentlemen are about to have a toast. First one. Thank So you might think it a bit odd they're having a toast, but uh, these were the ways that uh, war was operated in those days. It's all very gentlemanly, and uh, the Williamites would have been very pleased to have captured the castle, particularly the town itself. The Jacobites got pretty good terms. They were allowed to leave with their weapons and with their standards. Uh, so they were they were treated with honour uh, until they met some of the townsfolk on the way out of the town, of course, uh, when it wasn't quite the same thing. There was a lot of animosity between the people in the town and the Jacobite garrison. And Schomburg had to intervene to restore a little bit of order at one point. But this was the way that uh, sieges often operated. Sometimes they weren't quite as gentlemanly. And, um, 
previous, the largest siege would have been the siege of Londonderry, which is probably a lot better known in terms of wider history than the siege of Carrickfergus. Um, the siege of Londonderry, uh, there were a few attempts to try and capture the city. Uh, one of the French commanders wanted to uh, herd all the Protestant inhabitants of the areas around the city under the walls to either force the garrison to take them into the city. Um, or let them starve outside, and if they took them in, then they would have been using some of the supplies. So the idea was you'd have drained the, the supplies. Um, but nothing like that happened in Carrickfergus, and certainly not an earlier, an earlier siege in um, 1315 when Edward Bruce laid siege to the town. There's a, a legend that some of his uh, troops were allowed into parley, and the garrison were pretty low on provisions and they, they kept them in the town and may, ended up, uh, may have ended up eating them, in fact. So there was nothing like that during 1689 siege. And the Jacobites would have headed down to, towards Newry in that direction. And the Williamites now had complete control of the loch and uh, this whole area around County Antrim. And it was the culmination of an attempt, there had been an earlier attempt by the Council of the North as it was called, to try and uh, take Carrickfergus and a lot of gentlemen from uh, around the area like the Dodgeses and uh, Dalways and other families had plotted to try and seize the castle but that hadn't uh, come about until Schomburg arrived with his troops and successfully captured the castle. You're all very good about this William A. victory, I thought you might have cheered it when it was announced. There's a few cheers. <laughs> So we should now be getting to the stage where the garrison are going to come out of the town and uh, be escorted away. But in regard the garrison is in such disorders none to be admitted into the town but such a guard as we think fit to set to one of the gates which shall immediately be delivered to not us so far. according to the customs of war. So far, Frank, you know. Three, that the garrison shall march out and be conducted by a squadron of horse to the nearest garrison of the enemy, and there shall be no crowding or confusion when they march out. Four, that nothing be carried out of the town which belongs to the persons or other inhabitants. Five, that the governor obliges himself to deliver all cannon and other such arms, munition, victuals of any kind into the hands of such a commissary as shall be ordered by us to receive them. Six, that if there be anything due from the garrison to the inhabitants of the Protestant religion, it shall be paid and what has been taken from them shall be restored. Seven, that a safe conduct for all the inhabitants of the country and such of all the Roman Catholic clergy that came for shelter to this garrison shall be allowed that they go to their respective habitations together with their goods and there be protected pursuant to King William's declaration the 22nd of February last past. Eight, that care shall be given of the sick and wounded men of the garrison that cannot go along with their regiments and that when they are in a condition to follow the rest, they shall have our pass. The cards are the conditions. Do you accept? Sir, I accept these most gracious terms and thank you for them. Your Grace, the town is yours. Well? <laughs> Two gentlemen are about to have a toast. First
So you may think it a bit odd they're having a toast, but uh, these were the ways that uh, war was operated in those days. It was all very gentlemanly. And uh, the William Ace would have been very pleased to have captured the castle, particularly the town itself. The Jacobites got pretty good terms. They were allowed to leave with their weapons and with their standards. Uh, so they were they were treated with honour uh, on, until they met some of the townsfolk on the way out of the town, of course, uh, when it wasn't quite the same thing. There was a lot of animosity between the people in the town and the Jacobite garrison. And Schomburg had to intervene to restore a little bit of order at one point. But this was the way that uh, sieges often operated. Sometimes they weren't quite as gentlemanly. And, um, the previous, the largest siege would have been the Siege of Londonderry, which is probably a lot better known in terms of wider history than the Siege of Carrickfergus. Um, the Siege of Londonderry, uh, there were a few attempts to try and capture the city. Uh, one of the French commanders wanted to uh, herd all the Protestant inhabitants of the areas around the city under the walls to either force the garrison to take them into the city. Um, or to let them starve outside, and if they took them in, then they would have been using some of the supplies. So the idea was you'd have drained the, the supplies. Um, but nothing like that happened in Carrick Fergus, and certainly not an earlier, an earlier siege in um, 1315 when Edward Bruce laid siege to the town. There's a, a legend that some of his uh, troops were allowed into parley, and the garrison were pretty low on provisions and they, they kept them in the town and may, ended up, uh, may have ended up eating them, in fact. So there was nothing like that during 1689 siege. And the Jacobites would have headed down to, towards Newry in that direction. And the Williamites now had complete control of the loch and uh, this whole area around County Antrim. And it was the culmination of an attempt, there had been an earlier attempt by the Council of the North as it was called, to try and uh, take Carrick Fergus and a lot of gentlemen from uh, around the area like the Dodgeses and uh, Dalways and other families had plotted to try and seize the castle but that hadn't uh, come about until Schomburg arrived with his troops and successfully captured the castle. You're all very good at about this William Eight victory, I thought you might have cheered it when it was announced. There's a few cheers. <laughs> So we should now be getting to the stage where the garrison are going to come out of the town and uh, be escorted away. Fergus Castle was taken. Blood stained the land around. The silence was deafening. There was not a single sound in the end of a chapter. Recording violence complicated things from the bloodshed tale better known as the war of the two kings here come the vegetable brigade there as well. <laughs> Their arms, baggage, beating drums and fluttering flags. Schomburg had granted them safe passage to Newry. Safe 
passage for these broken and defeated nags. So we are moving forward exactly a year, to the year 1690, and William of Orange has landed in just the shore over there, 